Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this um, Cedar Jasmine webinar on using Python on Jasmine. My name is Ag Stevens. I'm the head of partnerships at Cedar, the Center for Environmental Data Analysis. Um, and I'm here with Richard Smith, who is one of our software developers. And um, big thanks to Richard from the start, because he's the man that's um, pulled most of these slides together and, and developed most of the material for this webinar. Before we start off, just a few words on housekeeping. Um, so we have um, one hour overall for the webinar, um, and that will include um, mainly presented material, but some time at the end for questions. And please note that there is a, a Q&A section, as indicated on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, you can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And at, at the end of the webinar, we will review the questions and do our best to um, respond to as many of them as we can during the time. Um, after the webinar, we'll send out a feedback form um, please take the time to fill this in because that helps us um, find out what you liked, what you didn't like, and will help us continue to improve. So what are we covering today? Um, we are going to talk about some use cases of how you might want to run Python scripts on Jasmine. So mainly focused on data analysis and working with data in the Cedar archive. Um, we are running Python 3 and we will take some time to talk about common features of these scripts. So things that they have in common that you might be able to reuse. Um, and then we will go into more detail about the four use cases that we are looking at and analyze some of the Python code along the way. So what will we know at the end of the webinar? One thing for sure, we cannot teach you the whole of the Python language in one hour. Um, but we will show you a number of good examples of what we consider to be good practice um, and there are a whole host of excellent online learning resources for Python if you are new to the language. Um, if you know a bit about the language, hopefully we'll be pointing you to um, some useful techniques and libraries that you can build on. So we're really trying to give you examples of code that you can pick up and work with. And, and we're also going to give some names to some of the concepts and libraries and things that you will see so that you can go away and search for those in your own time to find out more. In terms of the concepts that we'll be looking at, um, some of the basic Python concepts will include strings, um, sequences known as lists, a, another object known as sets. We will be talking about functions, so packaging, packaging up useful code into reusable um, components, and um, a certain type of object called a named tuple, which has its uses. In terms of the libraries that, that we are going to be demonstrating, um, these are typically um, libraries that you will import into your Python session, um, many of them are already installed on Jasmine. If you were using them elsewhere, you might sometimes have to install them yourselves. So NumPy is about managing numeric arrays. Pandas is typically about managing um, tabulated data. Xarray is a really useful library for working with um, NetCDF data sets. And Matplotlib is a very general purpose plotting library. So what are the use cases? The first use case um, that Richard will talk about uses the pandas library with CSV uh, data inside the Cedar archive. So this is about extracting statistics from hourly rainfall, um, generating um, a, an annual time series for a given station, and then plotting that. The second use case involves extracting NetCDF data um, using the X-ray library, and in particular extracting a UK subset of interest from a time series of surface temperature data. Our third use case is about working more with Matplotlib. So 
um, we have a script where you provide it with a bounding box and a time step and it will plot a variable on a map for you. And our last use case is um, actually about interacting with the file system. So typically on, on this, in the Cedar archive, we have this big directory structure that contains all these different data sets. And there's a lot of useful information um, and semantics in the, the names of each of those directories and each of those files. Um, so it's a common use case that you want to use tools and use Python to work your way through the directory structure, looking at patterns to find the way to find the data that you require to do your processing. Okay, so I'll hand you over now to Richard. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how to get started with Python 3 on Jasmine um, and then uh, how you run scripts on Jasmine. So running Python on Jasmine, we have Python 3 available on Jasmine using something we call Jaspy. Jaspy is a Conda environment that we've put together, which contains useful tools for analyzing your data. So these will have things such as uh, NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, X-Array. Um, the things that we're gonna talk about today, they are included in this Jasmine Python 3 environment. It's really easy to get it loaded up on Jasmine. Once you get into a Jasmine machine, you can just do module load Jaspy, and then you can see there, I check Python minus V just to see which version I've got, and we're running uh, Python 3.7. Then when it comes to running a script using Python, uh, you just run the Python command followed by the name of your script. So here we have an example where my script is called hello.py, and you just run Python hello.py, and it will run your script. This is happening on the Jasmine machines. So uh, we mentioned that we've got four examples and there are some common features between those four examples. So rather than going through them one by one, um, I've put them here at the beginning so we can discuss them before we see them later on in the code. So these are the things we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about how to import libraries. We're going to talk about how to give your script command line arguments and options. We're going to talk about organizing your code into functions. And we're going to talk about how to add comments to your code to make it easier to understand both for yourself later on and for other people if you uh, choose to share your code with others. And we're going to talk about uh, this if double underscore name double underscore equals main thing that you might see quite often in scripts. Uh, what does it mean? And um, we'll go through that. So first off, importing libraries. Python provides very basic functions and tools. So uh, there are print, which prints things to the terminal. You can get the length of a collection, whether that's a string or a list. Um, it tells you how many elements there are. You can turn things into a list. You can use DIR to look at an object and see what um, attributes it has and find out more about it. There's also help. Um, and these are called built-ins and they are available whenever you start Python. But you're going to want to do much more complicated things than this. And this is where libraries and imports come in. The Python standard library contains lots of useful tools. So there's a link there which takes you to the Python 3 standard library page. And there are many, many libraries um, for things like URL handling, um, iteration tools, loads of, loads of different things. So you can go through and look at those yourself or as you're browsing the web to find solutions to your problems, you'll often see these libraries imported in your um, Another thing is you might want to install third-party libraries. So if you're working with NetCDF4 data, then you'll probably want to install the NetCDF4 library. And you can use this, do this via pip. How do you use them in your scripts? You use this keyword import. So this is a, a screenshot from one of the scripts, one of the examples we've got. And here we're importing a few libraries to use during our script. This top line um, shows an example where you can rename the module when you import. So we're going to import X-Array, but instead of typing X-Array all the time, we rename it to R XR. Uh, this is something you'll probably see quite often in examples online. Uh, things like NumPy, people you often see it imported as NP. So um, that's where that comes from. It's also useful to add command line arguments to your scripts. 
So there are several libraries out there which help you to do this. I found this link the other day, which has a really good comparison of the different types. So um, there's argpass, docopt, and click tend to be the most popular ones. Um, and this URL, this link has a, a blog article which where someone goes through and shows how each of them might look to do to accomplish the same task. And it's basically up to you. Um, in these examples, we're going to use argpass because it's included in the standard library. Um, but I believe docopt is installed in Jaspy if you want to use that. So here is a function which handles our command line argument parsing. So um, we're going to go through it step by step and explain what each line means. So in this first line, you create an argument parser. Uh, there's a, you can add a description. So when you print help, it makes it clear exactly what your script does. Um, here we're adding a required argument. So here we have uh, the directory argument. So when you run your script, this script will require a directory path. And again, you can add help to explain what it is that um, this argument requires. This here with the dash line before the keyword is an optional argument. Um, here at the bottom, I've got a default of dot. So uh, this is an output directory and it defaults to wherever you're running your script from. And as you saw before, that was wrapped in a function. So this is what a function looks like. And we're going to go a bit more detail of how to build functions. So this top line here, this def followed by a word um, is where you define your so a function name and its arguments. So everything inside is in the brackets are arguments to that function. And before the brackets is the name of the function. Then it's really good to give a helpful description about what the function does. Um, you may think that if you've got a really simple thing, it's not worth it, but I assure you it's always worthwhile putting a little comment in to explain what this function does. Um, and to do function descriptions, you use a triple quote, which is a multi-line multi -line comment. Underneath that, you can put whatever your code does during its operation. And at the bottom, you can return something. So when the function is finished, it will return whatever you tell it to. If you don't put a return statement, it will return none. Um, so that's just something to remember if you're writing functions. If you get weird behavior or if you want nothing back, then it returns none. So I mentioned the triple quotes comments. Um, here are the two types of comments. Always write comments so it's easy to understand what's going on. Like I said, you may think that you'll know in six months what you've done, but um, you won't. <laughs> it's always <clears throat> always worth writing some comments so that while you're thinking about it, so you remember what you were thinking. And like I say, if, if you ever want to pass your code to somebody else, say you've written a really useful tool and, and someone says, oh, can I borrow that? It's really good to have some comments so you can read through and, and to show them what's going on. So triple quotes for function definitions or multi-line comments and then just this hash for line comments. So you'll see those in the example scripts. And then the last thing is, what is this double underscore name, double equals, double underscore main thing? Um, you see this quite often in Python. It's used to change the behavior based on whether you're running the file as a script or importing the file as a module. Uh, anything underneath this will run when the file is run as a script. So I'll explain what that means through a little example. So here we have a very simple script. It just has one line and it prints the variable double underscore name double underscore. When you run that script as a script from the command line, then it prints out double underscore main. But if you were to import that, it would import, it would give you the, the name of the file or the module. So useful behavior. So if you are writing code that you want to import, but you want to write some tests, that's a common use case, then you put it inside your this little double underscore name main block um, so that when you import things that your tests don't run. So now we're going to look at some use cases. First thing to say is that um, we can't go into full detail with each example. It would take too long and quite a lot of the, the stuff is shared between the four examples. All the code is available on GitHub. Um, so you can go to that link and all the code will still will stay there. 
Uh, there's a readme file to explain what each file does. There are some example paths you can try things out with on Jasmine uh, and just see how it all works. So uh, I fully recommend going and having a look at those after the webinar. All the examples share a common structure. Uh, we'll look closely at the first example and then pick up the main features from the other three. So the first example we're going to look at is pandas and CSV files. Pandas makes it really easy to read and do basic analysis of CSV data. So here is some example data that we've got. Um, there are 61 lines of header information. So you can see that 61 here, that's where your header ends. Then there is a column header. So this is your column names followed by the data, all comma separated values. Uh, at the top of the script here, we've got our imports. So there's a few things here, but we're importing pandas. Again, we've got that rename thing, so pandas as PD. Um, we're importing yard pass and we're importing a date parser as well. So you import everything you need at the top of the file. This bit at the bottom with matplotlib is uh, not something you'll see commonly on web examples, but it's something you'll need when you're working on Jasmine. Uh, this is mostly because you can't do an interactive plot on Jasmine. So uh, you set it up like this and then it will produce plots and save it to disk, which you can then copy to your local environment later. And at the bottom of each of the examples, you'll see this, um, which we talked about with double underscore name equals double underscore main. Um, and then there's this main function. All this is saying is run the main function when you run this script from the command line. So let's look at the actual algorithm that we're going to work with here. There's a lot here, but don't worry, we're going to break it down step by step uh, and dig into the individual parts. So this first step here, we parse the command line. Um, that was that function that we looked at before. And this just gives you back your command line arguments. In the next step, we get a list of the CSV files that we want to use. So um, again, we'll dig into that in a second. Then we extract our annual precipitation. Then we make a plot and we save the plot. So it's quite a simple workflow. Get your combined line arguments, generate a list of files, extract your annual precipitation, make the plot, save the plot to disk. All right, now we're gonna look at each of those steps in a bit more detail. So this is our section where we're getting our list of files. Uh, I'm gonna break down what each of these elements are. So this first bit here, args.directory. Remember we had um, directory as one of our command line options. And you can access it by name using this args dot name of your option. So this gets you the directory you give it at the command line. This section here matches all files ending in dot CSV. This OS path dot join joins the two strings together using a forward slash. So that creates a, a directory path with um, a match to all the CSV files. And then this glob dot glob goes away and pattern matches out on the file system and brings back a list of all the files that you want that match your pattern. Then we're going into processing our files. So first step we do is we use pandas to create an empty table with the columns that we want so we can put our statistics in later. Then we go through all of the files that we've got in our list of files get the annual statistics and add it to our new table. So now we're going to dig into what this extract annual statistics function is doing. And I say here, behold the power of pandas, because um, you'll see how easy it is just to analyze this file uh, and lots of files. This first line here, it reads the CSV file, discards your 61 lines of header content, builds a table with the column headers from the file all in one line. So that's, that's all you need to build a nice table um, with easy to access attributes from your CSV file. And that means you can access the data using the column names. So we're interested in precipitation. There was a column in the file called precip amount. So we get our table dot precipitation amount and that's our data in, inside this file. The data is a NumPy array, so you can use NumPy methods, things like min, max, and mean, 
Uh, NumPy is really powerful for numerical processing and it's worth looking into what kind of operations you can do. Uh, because once you have some idea of that, then you know you can do those things with pandas and CSV. And this line here, we're making a new table and we're using year as our row number or index. So that means that we, in this case, we're just creating a one line response, which just has the year of our file and the min, max and mean value. And we go back out to our processing files function um, where we've added our file content to our precipitation TS data frame. And then we return that back to the main, main script. Now the really great thing about pandas is you can create a graph directly from the pandas data frame. And this is all it takes. So actually there's only one line in there that actually makes the graph. So we have um, precip underscore TS dot plot, and that will take your table and plot it on a graph. The other stuff, the first one is just to tell you what's happening. And the last line just adds a title to your graph. And that's what you get. So you've, you, we had our columns min, mean, and max, and we've plotted a time series across our data set um, with just a few lines of Python. And here is an example of it running uh, to give you an idea of how long it takes. So off it goes, it processes the files. Here we're reading 51 files and extracting min, mean, and max values. generates plot, saved, and that's it. You've analyzed your data and you've built a graph um, with a, an annual time series, 51 CSV files. Next, we're gonna look at X-Array in the context of NetCDF. Uh, and what we're trying to do is extract the annual mean temperature from a time series over the UK region. So one thing about X-Array is it uses something, a framework called DASC, which is a pro parallel processing framework and this allows your computer to break down the task into smaller chunks and run it in the background. And this helps it to run faster. So there are some benefits of using X-Array um, with NetCDF. So again, we're gonna look at the algorithm, how you run through it. Um, so we've seen this before, but we, we parse our command line arguments. We get our list of files. I said that they were very sim similar between the four examples. Then we extract our UK region. We resample our UK region to make it an annual average. And then we create a new net CDF file with that content. So our new net CDF file is the UK annual temperature at surface um, for our time series. So let's look into our extract UK time series function that we had up here. So this is what it looks like. Um, the first step is to open all the files and combine them into one big data set. So X-Array has this really useful function called open MF data set, which I believe is multi-file data set. Uh, and then this combine keyword allows you to combine them by a particular uh, axis. So with this case, we're gonna combine it by coordinates. So we map them onto the same grid. This section here, which I won't go into too much detail, but this just allows you to convert to use the minus 180 to 180 as your longitude coordinates. Um, the UK is particularly tricky to slice around because it crosses the meridian. So when the file is 0 to 360, um, you have to move it. And here we just cut out our UK region. So there's this uh, cell method on a X-ray data set which selects based on your conditions. So here we're, we're creating a slice between the minimum and maximum latitude and the minimum and, latitude, that minimum and maximum longitude. And then we send our region of interest, which is our X-ray data set, um, back to the main script. The next bit we do is we resample to get that annual mean. So this is a, a nice, really simple convenience thing that X-ray has built in. So we resample based on a particular key. In this case, we're doing time. And there are document in the documentation, it tells you the values you can use. So here we sampling over one year and we're getting the mean. So again, this is a NumPy operation. So we've got uh, the mean over one year for our data set. 
This is an example of it running. And that's that. We now have a slice over the UK um, temperature at surface. I'm going to pass over to Ag now. He's going to talk about the next couple of use cases. Okay, so the next two use cases, um, the first one is looking again at, at the use of matplotlib. Um, and then we're going to talk about finding files in the CEDAR archive and building tools to be able to help you identify different parts of the file system. So the first use case is about being able to visualize data um, that has been extracted from NetCDF data um, and getting that directly from an X-ray data set again. So in this example, the script um, is able to plot data from the era interim data set that is in the, held in the CEDA archive. And if you are a CEDA user and a Jasmine login user, you will automatically have access to this data set because it's um, distributed on open license. Um, so here we can see the, the signature of the script. So the script is called data underscore visualization dot pi. And you can see that the, the argpars library allows us to um, get this view, automatically generate this view of, of what you can do with the script. So we have a um, minus minus time step option to select time steps, one or more. And we have a, a B box or bounding box option, which takes four values. Um, and we have a directory where the source files are found. So if we look here at the main function, so again, we're following the same pattern. The, the main function here goes through a number of stages and we can break those down into an algorithm. So once again, the first part of the algorithm is calling the parse args function, um, which will parse any command line options that have been provided by the user. We then go on to create a bounding box object um, that will be used um, further on. We then go in and extract the region of interest um, and that calls another function and then we generate a plot, a contour plot in this case, um, over the region of interest. And we um, modify that plot slightly to add coastlines onto it. And then finally, at the end here, we are saving the plot using something that, that we're getting used to now, the um, plt.savefig method. Okay, so there are various parts of the algorithm. Um, one of them is create bounding box. So this is interesting because this, this introduces a, a new concept that we haven't seen yet, which is a, a Python type called a named tuple. And a named tuple allows you to create an object um, where that you can, you can access its attributes by their names or their labels instead of um, by their index. Um, so why is this useful? We can go and have a look. Essentially, the use of a name tuple converts the, the um, bottom view here to the top view. So if we look at the top view, you generate this thing called a bounding box name tuple, and you give it your northern southern latitudes and your eastern western longitudes. Um, once you've generated this thing, you can then access any one of those attributes by their name. So here we print bbox.max underscore lat, which is the maximum latitude, which from a, a usage point of view is very clean and straightforward. We know exactly what we're accessing. Um, the version underneath that, that um, presents the bounding box as a, a tuple, or it could be a list, but essentially it's a, ser a sequence of values. Now it's the same, same values as above, but when you're trying to access them, you're now in a situation where you have to reference them by index value. And so we're referencing the first value with bbox zero, but we have to remember that that's the northernmost latitude. 
Um, so in this case, we find it really useful to use a name tuple because it means that once we've generated it, we can look up any of those values without having to remember um, the structure in which we created this thing and the order that we set them in. So another part of the algorithm is plotting data. So what happens here? So we have a nice print statement here just telling us that we're about to generate the plot. And then the next thing that we do is we generate the axes. Um, and in this case, we are setting the projection that we are going to um, use when we, we plot this data. So we are projecting it to the, the plate carry projection. The next thing we do in this um, plotting stage is a whole heap of things in a single line. So here we are using X-Array and we are selecting the wind variable from our ROI variable. So, so in the code, ROI is the region of interest. So it's the essentially the X-Ray data set that we've got back um, from our extraction. Um, within that, there is wind, so we are selecting that. Um, and then we are taking a selection, a, a slice through that um, at the first time and the first height. Um, the, the object that that returns is then something that can be called, that, that has a, a plot capability. So we can, we can um, select the, the plot attribute of that. And within that, there are a number of plotting methods. And in this case, contour F is a filled contour plot. And we are sending the axes into that. The next thing we do is that we set the extent for the bounding box that we want to view. So in this case, we are using each of the values of that named tuple um, to set the extent so that the plot itself will match the extent of the region of interest that we extracted. And then um, another useful matplotlib construct, we can add coastlines um, to our plot. And so matplotlib will look up its own internal um, reference coastline and, and overlay that onto our plot. So we get this nice contour plot um, of the 10 meter wind speed, um, all generated there using X-ray to extract the data and create the right object, and then sending that through to matplotlib. So our, our final use case is about finding files in the Cedar archive. And this uses a concept called globbing that many of you will have come across when working particularly in a, a Linux um, or Unix operating system um, where you might use wildcards such as the asterisk um, in order to match anything along the file path. So when you're in Python and you want to do a similar thing, you will import the glob library and, and then you can call glob.glob .glob and give it a string which is a pattern which will have um, any number of specifiers within it, um, such as um, asterisks or, or other ways in which you might want to specify different options. So if we think about the um, CEDAR archive, the CEDAR archive is, is made up of numerous data sets. So in this example, we are looking in um, one of the Earth observation data sets under slash NEODC. And this is part of the European Space Agency's climate change initiative, and it's the sea ice data in particular. Um, so you can see there are various things in there that might be of interest. So we've highlighted in orange um, those that we're going to be particularly interested in for this script. So the first is variable. Um, so we find that at the fifth level of the directory structure. Um, and as we move down, we can see that we can select Northern or Southern Hemisphere, and then we have year and month included as well. So in this case, our script will display a list of directories at each, le at each level, and then ask the user to pick the directory that they want in order to identify the data that they want. So it allows you to explore a section of the archive without having to go and look inside each folder yourself. Okay, so in terms of the, the key functionality of this script, we are 
Um, we, we've embedded it in a get underscore options function. And this function takes a single path or directory as its one argument. So the first thing we do is we get all the files and directories which match the pattern that the user's passed in. So this might be a, a, a pattern with um, any number of asterisks in, and this glob option will match them all and store them in a list. What we have to do then is filter out the files because we're only interested in this case in directories. Um, so this little construct here will loop through each of the items that we have found. And if it's a directory, then it will keep it but if it's a file, it will not bother adding it to the new um, setting of this list known as items. The next thing we do is we get the contents of the new directories. Um, and so here we're using os.scander, um, which will go through and get the contents of those and add them all to this new list, which is called DERS. And then we, we go through that and we keep only the new unique values. And we do that in this case by only keeping those that are directories. And in this case, we are converting the, the um, response into a, into a set, which filters out any duplicates. Um, and then finally, we return a sorted version of that. So if we look here, just an example of the file system, we have the, um, some MVSAT data. And if we use glob.glob .glob in Python for this, this MVSAT directory structure, we can see that Python will return um, multiple directories um, called 0, 1, and 0, 2, because they're found under each year in this particular structure. OK, so. If we wanted to run the script, we want to get the sea ice thickness for both hemispheres for April 2005 from MVSAP. So here we can show an animation in action of running through the script. So at each, at each level, it will identify the options and then the user can provide input to say exactly which um, components that they are interested in. So we call the script file listing and we send it an initial path and then it will hunt through at each level and you can make a selection and it will tell you what's there. So this is a useful script for just traversing the file system without having to go through manually and look at it. Okay, so that's taken us through all our use cases. Um, I hope you found that useful and interesting. And um, as we mentioned, the, one of the key things here is that all the examples that we've shown are in a, a public GitHub repository. Um, and you can go there, um, look at them, try them out on, on Jasmine yourself or, or try them out elsewhere. Um, there's also a few other useful bits of further information linked to here. So we link to the general Python 3 documentation um, and also Richard showed a link earlier on um, that compares different ways that you can parse command line arguments. Um, so if you like arg parse, you can stick with it, but there are other options such as docopt and click that you might be interested in trying out. Okay, so that takes us to the end of the webinar. And we invite you now to ask questions. 